my, either my sister or my mother or my brother, they know that I didn't need any education in speaking loud. I knew that from the day I got out of my mom. I hope you all are comfortable. If you're not, as you can see, could, you, Edna, could I ask you to please reopen that door? We will have people in there with children. Oh, okay. We have children in there. Okay, um, they can go to the other end of the hall. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so, as I say, they, uh, we will be, there's not, not a lot of noise in here, and it's a good evening. I wanted to explain to you before we start if your phones are turned on, please put them on vibrate. Um, in the back of the room, we were going to be recording the event so that it can be webcast. We had several requests for that. And recognizing, as so many people told me, I can't control phones or cameras or anything else, so I might as well just live with it, the broadcasting, and know that that's part of the 21st century. Across the hall is, are the restrooms. If there is an emergency, the way you came in is one way out. There's also an exit here that goes straight out to the back of the building. So if you hear a fire is on, go off. I want you please to do exactly what they taught you to do in elementary school. Stand up and calmly exit through the nearest door. No mad dashes or anything like that. No yelling, no screaming. I really appreciate that. And if you would like to use the water in the faucet, the skinny handle is filtered water, and the cups are up there. I'd like to thank Julie Ham for her donation of the coffee this evening. Thank you very much. We are going to begin with introductions from the presenters on their perspective on Common Core Standards, and then we will move into prepared questions which will last about an hour. <clears throat> After that, we'll give them an opportunity to wrap up based on what we've discussed, and then we will allow you the opportunity to ask them questions. I haven't seen that go on for more than a half hour, but if it needs to, we, I will allow it to go on for 45 minutes to an hour if it's a lively discussion. If you guys <clears throat> don't need that, then it will be fine with me. So. Pat Higgins is a human resources professional with more than 30 years of senior human relations management experience in the public and private sector. As someone very involved in hiring the students and graduates from the Anchorage School District, he is passionate about, passionate about the role of good education and improving our vocational opportunities for young people. Pat has worked and traveled throughout Alaska from the North Slope when he worked for Alaska Pipeline, initially in charge of employment and later as first internal employee concerns program investigator. He went on to Sitka Juno where he served as human relations director and a member of the executive management team for the Alaska Native owned Southeast Alaska Regional Health Consortium and as a human resources consultant for Coastal Villages Region Fund, an organization with fishing and crabbing in interests in the Bering Sea that was formed to provide employment and community development opportunities to 200 rural communities on the west coast of Alaska. Pat graduated from Louisiana State University with a degree in personnel management before moving to Anchorage in 1983 with his wife of 35 years, Patty, son Gavin, and daughters Rachel and Tara, as well as grandson Ivy. I'm very grateful to Anchorage School Board member Pat Higgins for agreeing to be with us tonight. I had a very difficult time finding someone who would step forward and speak on the pro side of Common Core Standards, and he said, I'm a politician, you can't scare me. <laughs> <laughs> Our first presenter tonight is Dr. Haney. Her PhD is in economics. She, has also, she also has a background in public policy and Republican politics. Although she is still active in the field of economics, her recent professional work has been in the area of social media. She is currently serving as the Vice Chair of Interior Alaska Conservative Coalition 
and has served as a Republican District Chair, Vice Chair of the GOP Golden Heart, and was a national delegate in 2012. She was the co-director of Gingrich for President in Alaska in 2012 as well. Dr. Haney was part of a team that helped elect conservatives, which brought about a Republican majority in Alaska State Senate and strengthened the majority in the State House in 2012. Barbara has participated in various gubernatorial and house races throughout the state and across the nation. She works as, has worked as a faculty member at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Washington State University, Eastern Illinois University, McKendree College, St. Mary's College, and the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Haney's current focus is stopping the implementation of the Common Core Initiative in Alaska. Barbara administers a Facebook page devoted to this cause at www.facebook.com Stop Common Core Alaska, if that's AK, and a website StopAlaskaCommonCore.com. And she works with the Restoring America Together group with, with various other coalitions. Barbara is a wife, a mother, and a grandmother to a lar rather large contingent in the Fairbanks North Pole area, as well as South Carolina and Illinois. As I said, we will have a three to five minute presentation from each of our participants tonight, and we are beginning with Dr. Barbara Haney. Please join me in welcoming her. I'm, I'm an educator, that's my ethic, that's how I've always lived, so. Um, you know, originally when I was looking at the Common Core, I really didn't have an opinion about it one way or the other. I was like, oh yeah, this is another education fad. You know, it's like, oh, I don't know, let's see, well, just that whole language, and let's see, what else was it? Uh, there was this modification of phonics, and then when I was a kid, there was another new math, and before that, there was another new math. It just seems like every few years there's these cycles and fads. And so you kind of look at it and go, oh boy, what's this new fad? The difference with this new fad than all the other past new fads is this one was heralded in by a very radical president and a very radical group of individuals. Their objective is not just a few modifications in education. Their objective is to radically alter America and they're doing it through the school system. If you look at who is in charge of the Common Core curriculum, who has been the people who have been behind that movement, Linda Darling Hammond is the number one person. She was Barack Obama's advisor in his campaign. She is currently in charge of Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium that our state just signed into. In addition, wearing a separate hat, but in the same body, she also reports to UNESCO at the United Nations and reports on all the activities going on in American education in that capacity. So much power does this woman have that Barack Obama flies to see her. He does, she does not fly to see him. What does that tell you? Linda Darling Hammond's number one idol in life is this guy named uh, Lev Vygotsky. Lev Vygotsky, uh, that was Lenin's go-to guy for implementing communism. That, if you open the teacher materials, that is what you're going to see. Lev Vygotsky, the wonders of him. I have it, it's not, like I said, it's on my website if you want to see it. That's what's in these teacher materials. That's what these teachers are being taught, even in childhood education, about how wonderful Lev Vygotsky is. Piaget is gone, he's out the door. Okay? So, I started taking a look at what this curriculum did. And the first thing I thought was, you know, I know a federal curriculum is illegal. It's against the Tenth Amendment. In addition to being against the Tenth Amendment, it's against the 1975 Elementary and Secondary Education Act, and it's also against the charters, the 1979 Act, that established the Department of Education that many of us would like to see grow by life. But, needless said to be that as it may, they still managed to do that through a provision in the 2009 stimulus package on student, uh, in the, they created something called Race to the Top. Through the Race to the Top, they created two consortia. One consortia is called College and Career uh, Partnership 
for assessing college and career we see in its park, uh, readiness for college and career standards. So it's called PARC. That's in, basically based out of Florida. The other one is called Smarter Balance Assessment Consortia. That's based, uh, it's in Spokane, Washington right now, but they're building a building at the University of California campus where Janet Napolitano will also be the head of the University of California system. And that is who we will be having um, our tests. And it, that's who's going to be governing that consortia. Sorry, that's true. There's no way should have voted. Um, if you take a look at what they've created, and Linda Darlingham talks about this when she does her talk with the United Nations, they have created a way to institutionalize Obamaism. Okay? So I'm going to tell you something. No matter what is in those standards, even if you think they're the cat's meow, all right, you need to be very concerned about this because this is taking local control away from schools. Now, my, my good friend here from Anchorage is going to tell you, well, you know, we adopted the Common Core before this day. We have total local control. And you do right now. Because up until this year, you haven't been in a consortium. But once that state is in a consortium, you better believe that's, you know, you're done. Because that consortium takes over authority and for you to get any changes in those standards, it's no longer going to the local school board. You have to go to the Congress to get it done. At any rate, there's a lot of things in the standards and the curriculum I can talk about, obviously, in a five-minute presentation. I'm not going to do that. The one thing I want to impress upon you is this. This was implemented illegally in this country. And <clears throat> there has been very little effort or pushback. There's starting to be some pushback now in Congress. If we don't, even if you love the stuff that's in the curriculum, if we don't push back now, what's going to happen is if you're going to want to make any changes in anything, you're going to have to go to Washington to do that. If for some reason the Anchorage School Board decides they don't want to teach, I don't know, something, and you think the division of fractions should go from the sixth grade to the fourth grade, you're going to have to find several other states to go along with you to go to Congress. And that's the loss of local control. First of all, let me just tell you that this originated, uh, the Common Core Standards, with the National Governors Association. And, and if we're going to examine Common Core without all of the uh, surrounding issues, uh, then we need to look at why they chose to do it. And that's predominantly Republican, by the way, the, the Governors Association. And their focus primarily, to start with, was on career technology. What they're hearing from businesses is that kids are not ready for school. I mean, for work, when they graduate. They are not prepared to do that. We are hearing from colleges that they were not prepared. We are hearing that they were not ready to be competing in the world. And we know that the standards are low. And if, what's worse is that the standard in Alaska is lower than other states. I'm going to tell you, our cut point is below that. And it's, it's sad that we're in that category. So we're talking about the future of children in, for all Alaska. And when I look at a problem and I try to talk about it, I'm a, I'm a management background, I follow a PACE model. A PACE model says before you start analyzing the solutions, you talk about the problem. You talk, what are you trying to solve? Then you talk about the options, then you select something, then you test it and you evaluate it. And so we've got to first start off by talking about what is the problem that the council, that the governor saw when they took on this, this test, this task. Uh, First, we have low standards. We know that. Uh, the standards are low. We are behind the world in that, but Alaska is behind the rest of the, of the country, and we're behind the world. Second, they're outdated. I'm going to tell you that the skills required to be competitive in the future is not the same as today. 20th century education, a closet full of books. Learn that material. Gather it all. You, can, you, can, you know that information. You've got a good education. Go out and make a good career. What does it take 21st century education to go out in the Library of Congress? which is like the size of Washington, D.C. these days. It doubles in size every four years because knowledge is doubling. Find the information you want, bring it back, process it, and apply it. If you want to survive in the future, you've got to have those skills. We don't have those skills as part of our process. And we know that. We know that we're behind the scale, the scale in that one. What makes this really challenging is we are a mobile society. I mean, you've got your kids that are military uh, kids, families, that are sacrificing, they're here today one day, they're going to be in North Carolina, 
They're going to be in Oklahoma. They're going to be in Florida. What we teach in third grade doesn't align at all with the skill sets that they are teaching in third grade. They go from third grade where they are behind here. They go to some place in fourth grade where they weren't prepared. And then they go back here. It's back and forth. This is a mobile society. In Anchorage, our curriculum wasn't aligned either. And I've got to tell you, we got 27% of our kids that, that enrolled last semester, last month in the school that will not complete school in that same school. They will change schools over one out of every four. And if they go from one school to the other and, the, and, and things are not aligned, the skill sets in third grade, they're not prepared for fourth, they're not going to be successful at fourth. And if our skill sets don't at least match other states that they're moving to and going to, it's a nightmare. And the governors recognize this. I mean, I give them credit. They're saying, let's do something different. Um, you know, what this business is telling us, these kids are not ready. I saw an ad for the um, uh, state, for the, for, the, for the court system, and for H, assistant HR director. This was in last week. Had to have a degree, had to have years of experience, and please submit a writing example that you primarily <coughs> did. They don't believe that we've got the skill sets in this, in this area. Half of all of our doctors in this country are foreign born. We do not compete well. We are not setting up the standards necessary for us to be successful. So what are they doing? I mean, we're trying to be competitive and, and to do that. The Common Core Standards is rigorous, it's well-defined, and it's clear. And if a child is here in third grade, the expectation is you can use any curriculum. Then it doesn't matter. We just change from everyday math to go math. Are we going to change from go math? No. We have optional programs. I support those. We're not going to change that. We have charter schools that have different curriculum. That's going to continue. But we are ratcheting up the expectation that in second grade you have certain skill sets. That when you get to the point of 12th grade, you're going to have a, 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 an education that's going to enable you to go to college, it's going to enable you to go in the career field if you're going into work, and you're going to have those skills prepared. Right now, we are not doing that for our kids. We have everything at stake here. I mean, if, if our children are not everything for us, then I think we're misplaced. The fact that you're here is reflective of the fact that you want to get information about the Common Core, and I think that's fantastic. I left a little bit of information out there. If you had a child that's in first grade, what would you see in the Anchorage School District? It's going to tell you what skill sets we've developed that's going to have to match. It's going to match up the national curriculum. If you go to third grade someplace else, it's going to do it. But you need to make sure that your children are going to have the skills to be successful. And the Common Core is absolutely critical, and it doesn't impact curriculum at all, except for ratcheting up the expectation. Thank you. Thank you both. I forgot to tell you where you are and who is your know, host tonight for the bad things do. Um, would my counterpart like to join me? I don't see where she's hiding somewhere. Okay. Oh, would you come? I'd like to get you to have, welcome my co sponsor for this event with Matt to Republican Women's Club, Colleen Sullivan Leonard. for putting this on. Um, it's great to get two different perspectives on this very important subject matter. So we just want to say thank you so much for being here tonight. Sorry, I've got a little bit of a froggy throat, but thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I'm the president of Valley Republican Women's Club. We'll move right into the questions. Thank you so much for coming and helping on this, Colleen. I truly appreciate it. The participants were each asked to provide me with five questions. And I took those five questions and have alternated them. We'll be starting with Mr. Higgins, with, with Dr. Haney first, and we'll be ending with Mr. Higgins at the end of the evening. So, Dr. I'm, may I call you Barbara and Pat? Barbara. Yeah, I've, been, I've been doing that for a couple of weeks now. This doctor and mister may be kind of uncomfortable for me. So thank you very much. So Barbara, why is the national curriculum superior over a state, or why is or is not a national curriculum superior over state or regional curriculum? 
I think, like Thomas Jefferson thought, local control by parents is appropriate, in my opinion. Thomas Jefferson, who was one of our founding fathers, that was a very major issue for him in the Federalist Papers. He said education works best when it has local control and when it's the parents that are in control. Every school that he tried to set up was that way. Was he always successful? Well, it was early America, and he, I think this was, uh, you know, after his presidency, his kind of like his part-time job after, that he created for himself after the presidency. But that was where his, his focus was after the presidency, was establishing schools that were run by local areas, local neighborhoods, communities, and was ran by parents. That was what he believed was the best. I guess I'm in agreement with that. Maybe perhaps because that's how I was taught. The other thing I think too is um, I have to question some of this mobility data that I'm hearing out of out of Anchorage. It may be that one in four will be moving out in Anchorage, but statewide that number is only two percent of people who leave the state. All right, and nationally it's one and a half percent. And to retool our entire curriculum for a small part of the population is really rather ridiculous um, and irrespective. One of the other things that you often hear is that, you know, how the Governor's Association got together and wrote this. They didn't. It was five people. I can name them. David Coleman, Susan Pumatel, um, Jason Zimba, and um, the other two. I'm sorry, it slipped my mind. I've got the video of the validation committee with me on my hard drive. The only reason why it's not on YouTube is because Dr. Milgram down at Stanford asked me not to put it on YouTube because he didn't, didn't feel comfortable doing that. But he's, I can burn it onto a CD for anybody. You can see that this, this was funded by the national government, by the national government, Arnie Duncan. Let me give you a case of boy. When Utah left the consortium, by the way, several states have left. But when Utah left, every time one of them have left, they've had to get permission from Arnie Duncan. Now, is it a local curriculum or a national curriculum? Why do I have to get permission from Arnie Duncan? And why does the state have to get permission from the Secretary of Education? Arnie Duncan. It's because it's not local. You don't have local control anymore. Thank you. Mr. Pat, would you please answer the same question, which is why is a national curriculum, why is or is not a national curriculum superior over state or regional curriculum? Let me start by saying Webster defines as as uh, defines curriculum as a course is offered by educational institutions. The Common Core state standards doesn't dictate curriculum. Uh, we're hearing that over and over again. It's not telling you what books to read. It's not telling you what courses to offer. It's telling you what skills you've got to come out with. That is dictating and that is controlling the level that what we're going to be teaching. We're not going to, we're not going to be eliminate math. You're not going to be able to include reading. And there is an expectation in, in reading materials that we're going to be able to read things other than uh, I know concerns out there of strictly fiction. They want to have more in the way of technical type materials. But there is nothing there that we're going to be teaching the same classes. We have optional programs in Anchorage, they teach different. We have uh, charter schools, they have a different one. We have Winterbury with the uh, uh, Waldorf, they are going to continue. They, in fact, they think it's going to align better with their skill sets. So we haven't limited ourselves to say that we are teaching the same materials that other states are doing. We change from everyday math to go math. I'm not changing math, no one is changing anything, and we're not changing the textbooks. But we are changing the expectations associated with it, and that is going up. And that means we have to cover them at different levels. So there are changes taking place, but it's not a curriculum. And so I'm going to challenge that issue right off the bat. And quite honestly, we can argue about where it originated and who presented what. I don't care if Ed Schultz did it or Rush Limbaugh. Personally, either one's fine by me. I'm going to evaluate the impact it has on our children's education and where it takes them. We don't have some type of core standards our children are not going to be competitive in this world unless they're more rigorous and well-defined and they're more, uh, uh, they're clear and their parents can be associated with it and educators can, can make sure that our kids are ready when they go from one grade to another. We have some serious issues out there and where it came from, I don't care. I really don't. We need to look at what the Common Core state standards was all about 
the governors were right. We've got to have some type of relationship here. It's going to work better for educators, but most important, the only thing that really matters, it's got to prepare our kids to be ready, competitive, and for ready for college and ready for jobs, and they are not today. And this Common Core State Standards being stronger and more aggressive, I think it's the best thing we can do. But is it national over state or regional? First of all, 45 states are involved with it, five or not. Uh, and so we have an issue there. Is the state being directed by national? No, the states are buying into it. Uh, and so there's a difference that way as well. Thank you, Dr. I mean, I want to say 30 seconds. Our next, uh, no, I'm sorry, we can't. We're going to keep going question to question, take your notes, and get ready for the end. Uh, Pat, the next question will be directed to you first. What do you believe caused the governors, Democrat and Republican, to push for the new Common Core standards, and why did Governor Parnell adopt similar standards? I think the governors are frustrated with hearing from employers that their kids, that their kids graduating from school are not ready to work. Uh, we hear it at the Chamber of Commerce, we hear it at other places, and they are frustrated. They are frustrated because if you go to colleges, they say that when the kids come out of high school and they start college, we've got to do remedial classes. They aren't ready for that. And they also said if we're going to fix it, what do we have to do to fix it? I think they know they've got a transient situation with kids transferring different locations, and they wanted a fix. They wanted to say, how are we going to address this issue? One of the complaints from educators is we get kids in coming in at third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade into our system. They're at different levels, and it's difficult to teach those kids because they aren't coming in with the skill sets from other locations so that they're ready to learn. And that drains down the entire education system. So they wanted to go ahead and address it. They, their first response was CTE, Career Technology. That's not a, I don't think that's a dispute. That was the issue that the, the governors were seeing. But they expanded it and said, how do we really fix the problem? And they know they can't do it on an on a isolated basis. They needed some strong standards. And they needed the resources that you get when you consolidate them. You, you know, it, put it, coming together with a consortium with different states coming together, we're going to end up with, with some, uh, uh, some outcomes, I think, that are very positive because they said we need to fix the picture. We can't do it the way we've always been doing and expecting different results. I think that we all know that's the definition of insanity, right? Same thing over and over again, different results. You're not going to get it. You have to be willing to change what we're doing and to challenge the status quo. I, I don't, I'm tired of the status quo in education. I was tired when I got into education where we only had 60% graduating in, in Anchorage. We now have 75%. We're on our way to get 90% by 2020. But we did it because we said this isn't going to work. This is not acceptable and we've got to make changes. We've done a lot of changes there. This is one of the most constructive changes that I've seen. And our teachers are buying into it. They know they have to raise their standards. We're monitoring their outcome and their performance. They're going to be held accountable at a higher level. I think that's great. But uh, a national over state or regional isn't the issue because we are not directing with the common core state standards. We are not directing quickly. Thank you. Dr. Haney Barbara, you what do you believe caused, don't laugh at me, I'm having no. a hard time here. <laughs> what do you believe caused the governors, Democrat and Republican, to push for the new Common Core standards and Governor Purnell to adopt the similar standards? Okay, so it's pretty clear to me what happened. Arne Duncan said, uh, oh, you don't like these, you're, what happened is if No Child Left Behind, he need to meet annual yearly plan increased dramatically, okay? The number, the percentage of students you needed to make AYP. They used to call it make AYP, right? So to make AYP, the percentage went up and you had a lot of people who freaked out on it. Okay, so to get their federal funding, they had to meet that. Ah, but if you adopt Common Core and you apply, you know, adopt Common Core, Apply for a race to the top grant and apply for a waiver. Well, if you've done those things, we'll give you this waiver from No Child Left Behind. And that's exactly what happened. That's why all these states bought in. Okay? And of course, we have a wonderful consortium. And if you're the first one out the gate, you may not get money, but by gosh darn, we'll make you a governing state. So of course, all the blue states that like Obama said, Oh, yeah, we love you, we love this. And there the blue states are all on the governing board 
of the consortium. And who are the advisory states? The ones being governed? The red states, because we were like dragging our feet, you know, because uh, in Alaska's one of them, Wyoming's one of them, okay? But at the same time, you've seen state after state after state group. I mean, just this summer, you've seen five or six states in the consortium. But what I want to get down to is this notion of children not being able to, uh, why the standards were adopted. In part was because people felt that people that were college and career ready. As I was the intake specialist in the state, I did intake interviews on every one of the students who were rejected by the university because they needed remediation. I was given a little slip by the university system and any of them in the interior. I did an intake interview with each and every one of them who was required for them to go back to the university. I can tell you what happened in each and every case. I can't tell you the individual names because I'm still, I guess, to this day covered by federal privacy laws, but I can tell you general trends that I saw and a lot of it, I could tie to two or three teachers in a particular teaching method. That is, learn to program the computer, learn to program the calculator, instead of teaching the equation. Most of these kids didn't know their math tables, didn't know their times tables, and I hate to say it, they were survivors of everyday math. And you and I both had the same opinion on that. So, um, and that is an issue that goes beyond Common Core. Common Core doesn't solve it. Common Core doesn't fix it either. Thank you. Our next question will begin with Barbara. <laughs> what do you see as an advantage to Common Core over other approaches? What do you see as not being an advantage to Common Core? And what do you see better in Trivium or other models? Okay, so with Common Core, one of the big advantages I see is law school control because if you want to change any of the standards, as long as you're in a consortium setting, you have to go to Washington and change it. And that's the key, is once you're in a consortium setting. And while Anchorage did have the Common Core, they weren't in a consortium setting until this year. None of us were. And this is going to be breaking ground. My position has always been if West Watch Catella locally decides that that's what they want, cool beans. <laughs> um, we're going to decide our thing, you decide your thing, have a good day, nice life, and see you later. You know, it's local control. Uh, the consortium changes that, though, dramatically. And it requires a set of technology and data that is actually not even available in, this, in what they're requiring by 2018 is not even available in Anchorage. It's one gig broadband, and that that is going to be expensive. And when you look at the other needs in Alaska, I question whether broadband is the wisest thing for our state to put as a financial priority. I think eating and a lot of other things are important kind of hard to learn when you're freezing your butt off. Uh, in, in addition, I uh, don't, just don't think it's the right approach. One of the issues that um, I wasn't able to really get cleared up with Pat, and, and I'm, so I don't want to attack anybody for this, the Common Core has a set of exemplars in it. It does have curriculum in it. They're in the appendices. And that's why people say there's no curriculum in the standards. There is curriculum there, and they're in the appendices. And if you go look, at the book, The Blue Aside, it's in the 11th grade curriculum that is in the appendices, A, B, and C. It doesn't matter whether you like the curriculum or not. The teachers are gun ho because their pay and performance is now tied to student test scores on the curriculum. And that is through the accountability measure that is in the No Child Left Behind waiver and the second component, beyond the core curriculum. So whether or not you like it, well, that's your job there, right? And if you want to get paid, if you want to get promotion, you want to get, you, and you sit there and say, well, that's how the school board is, that's the state laws right now. That's what's currently under the No Child Left Behind waiver, under the new accountability measure, AM, AM, AMO, Annual Measure of Outcomes. So the teachers are, yeah, they're real good to know about the common core because if they don't, what's going to happen? Uh, that's their pay, you know? It uh, doesn't matter what's in the state standards. doesn't matter whether or what's in that curriculum. What you're going to be focused on, if you're a teacher right now, is what's on that SBAC test. Because if you don't get the scores on that SBAC test, you are going to be in deep doo-doo in your school. And heaven help you if a Native kid doesn't pass that SBAC test, because if you look at the weights, they are based on race. All right? And a, and a native child is worth four times a white child in the annual measures of accountability. So, you know, 
That's the way it is. If you're married, you don't go home. <laughs> that's your and that's your income, right? So, yeah, your turn. What do you see as an advantage to the Common Core over the appro approaches such as the Trivium or other models? Well, how many other people had to look at Trivium to be able to answer that question? I did, so I'll go confess that right off the bat. Um, and my biggest concern I was trying to pronounce it correctly too, so I didn't really like that question for that reason. Uh, I've read a number of articles about it to try to catch up on it. I love the internet. You just Google the heck out of it and go for it. Uh, you know, its description goes and it says consisting of a form of education based on Western culture with a particular focus on education and students taught in the Middle Ages. Three phases of student development. Primary, primary teaches the student how to learn. Secondary conceptual framework that can hold all human uh, knowledge and fills in the basic fact, develop skills, uh, and then third will be the person developing a person for an educated profession. And there's a number of articles that kind of refer to it as a liberal arts kind of approach. So I'm not sure where we were trying to go with that particular one. No. Uh, that's okay. Uh, the, the issue is, you know, first of all, will teachers be teaching based upon the common core standards? God, I hope so. Uh, I hope that a second grade teacher that's teaching math is going to realize they have got to make sure they cover certain material for that child to be successful in third grade. I want that. I think we need that. I'm not afraid of that. But I don't care what, how they go about doing it. I don't care what books they use. But there's an expectation that that child needs that level of education to be successful in the future. So I am not afraid of that. I'm going to tell you that if teachers are not teaching to the common core standards, then I think they have a problem. We're going to see those results. In Anchorage, we're measuring kids three times a year in math and, in, and language skills. We're reading them in the beginning, the middle, and the end, and we're seeing if they're developing a full year of growth every year. Because that way we hold teachers accountable. Are we requiring teachers to therefore teach to try to develop every child for a full year? Yes. I don't want teachers that aren't doing that. I am not afraid of the fact that teachers are being held accountable to some standard and being told you have to reach that standard. And if that means they've got to spend more time in some area and teaching a little math a little differently <coughs> because we have to be able to apply the math. I've heard math change with Common Core is basically it used to be a mile long and an inch thick. thick and that's it. Now it's deep. Now you've got to know the math to be able to use it. That is what the future is going to be all about. So those changes are there. Whether or not we cover everything and all the subjects, I need them to cover all those areas. I don't want a first grade teacher saying I'll focus on language, but I won't include math. They are going to have to have those skills to be successful in the next grade. And I don't care that the, that forces the teacher to say, look, they're going to be held accountable for that. They're not limited to teaching that. We're focused on skills. There's a difference here. We want a skill set level to be up higher. I don't care about the work that we use. I don't care what math program a charter school uses. I don't care what language they, what, what books they want them to read. But I do care that they can read. I do care that they can apply that, that was, those skills in math. And I do care that they can end up communicating effectively. Because if they can't, they fail, and then I consider myself a failure. Barbara. You began last time, didn't you? Uh, so I'm going to ask Pat to begin this time. I needed to take a breath there. Oh. What standards do you believe Alaska schools should establish to ensure that all children are ready for their next step after high school? I have, I believe both of you have already answered this question. Would you like me to ask it again? Uh, Barbara? That's up to you. I think we've pretty much, I feel great at that, we'll wave that Eat that like it did. The, the intent of that question was that in the absence of the Common Core standards, what would you establish, and that's the reason why I asked that question for Barbara, is that, well, we okay. will, let me go and let's answer it. Okay, okay. Yeah, we'll go ahead and let's answer it. Let's go and answer it, because I'll make it briefer. The question really is, timing. do we find acceptable today the standards that Alaska has? They're lower than the rest of the country. The country is lower than the rest of the world, or at least Western civilization. Is that satisfactory? And if that's not satisfactory, you don't want to go with something that, that's a higher, more rigorous standard because that's telling teachers they have to teach or whatever the issue is, what would you put into place? This is being put together by a lot of education groups out there that I can battle off. It's, it's, it's a tremendous number. And, and you've got funding from some pretty powerful groups. 
the Gates Group that has really done some pretty big things in, in, in Los Angeles school system, some of the others, but they're putting massive bucks into it. And whether you lack like their motives or anything else, it's the issue. What are we going to do instead? I think this is the best outcome. But to simply say status quo is okay is not okay with me. And that's what this is all about. No, it's not. I'm not about the status quo. Whoa, 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 whoa. Please let him finish and then I, you I'll, can I, have I, I, yes, he was actually. Yeah. Okay. I'll let her jump in. Go, go right. No, I, I'm not about the status quo. I, 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 that, I get it. I get okay. it. I'm trying to make this as common as possible. This is not, this is not the status quo. Here it is. The Common Core is about a uniform customer base. That's out of Bill Gates' mouth. All right? Don't doubt it for a minute. That's what this is about. It's about creating a uniform customer base. This is not about better expectations or better outcomes for your children. Because let me tell you if it was. If it was really about better outcomes, then let's go to the state of Massachusetts and take their English standards. Because they had the highest scores in the world. And let's take the standards they have before they adopted Common Core, and let's make those our standards. And let's take the standards that Indiana was using in the field of mathematics, and let's make those our standards that be cut before the Common Core. Because why? They had the highest standards in mathematics in the world. How's that? I just got you the world class standards without using Common Core. Instead of doing what we did in the state to adopt the standards we adopted, we should have been looking at who was successful, what are they doing right. But instead, <coughs> we hired a chief, which is what? Run <coughs> by who? The Gates Foundation and the Department, U.S. Department of Education is the two entities that fund a chief. A chief drew lists. Who what teachers would be on the curriculum committees? They drew lists. What people in the community would be on those committees? From there, those committees did crosswalks. Here's what they did. Let me give you a, I don't want to say that this sounds crass, but let me give you a crap sandwich and let me give you something that's not quite so much of a, of maybe liver, okay? Um, I'm going to take you and I'm going to show you how to appreciate this liver sandwich. Well, sure, you're going to appreciate the heck out of a liver sandwich because it isn't crap. But that doesn't mean that's the only sandwich out there, does it? Of course not. And they didn't look at anything else out there but the Common Core Standards. And that is listed, by the way, in the meeting notes of the Alaska uh, State School Board of Education, December 15, 4A1. If you pull out those minutes, you go to 4A1. You will see where that's listed. So really, quite frankly, how did Dr. Parnell end up getting this done? That's a very good question. Because all of a sudden, on April 4th, two days after I asked, called his office and said, are we adopting the Common Core? Oh, no, we'll never adopt the Common Core. I'm totally against it. April 19th, oh, we signed under uh, the consortium. We have college and career-ready standards. Not Common Core standards, but isn't that the definition? Just like last week. We're not in race to the top. Here's the website, Mr. Nussman. Would you like to see the website? Here's Alaska on the race to the top website. Oh. We weren't aware of that. That isn't how you do public policy. How you do public policy is very different. You don't let some outside third entity run your, run your state. Just based on that alone, you should reject the Common Core. Not because I think we shouldn't have good standards, but because I really reject the way public policy was undertaken. Taxpayers and parents had the right to be involved in this decision because they're paying the bill. They <coughs> who have the money, pay, they get to rule, right? Is that, that how school works? And they, who's paying? The parents. Okay, thank you. I'm not too hard at interrupting. <laughs> the, what evidence, evidence do you have that the Vygotsky's model is superior over Piaget's and is best for American children. And I believe this is your response, Barbara? You, oh, it's I, your turn to respond. Turn to go first. I, I reject Vygotsky entirely. Um, when Lenin first relented the Bolshevik re 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 revolution in Russia, he turned to a guy named Lev Vygotsky. Lev Vygotsky designed the psychometric approach to education where we collect data on students, uh, observe them under different stimuli, 
measure outcomes, measure their uh, information, all the, their responses, <coughs> and see where they're best suited in a planned economy. You don't get to pick what you want to be. You are determined that by the state. If you read Lev Vygotsky in the Russian or in the English, he is not in any way like the Lev Vygotsky that uh, Linda Darling Hammond portrays in the teacher education materials. If you know anybody who's been going to these Common Core teacher training things that have the booklets written by Linda Darling Hammond, you owe it to that person to let them know who Lev Vygotsky was. And if you are living, if you are a refugee in this country from the Soviet Union or from Soviet China or from any other communist country like Cuba, then you know who Lev Vygotsky is because his work was used for the Great Leap Forward. His work was used by Castro to design the re-education camps in, in Cuba. His work was used by Hugo Chavez in his re-education camps too. That's not what this nation is about. That's not who we are. That's who Obama is, all right? That's who William Ayers is. That's not what I want for my children and my grandchildren. That, well, my children are grown, but it's definitely not what I want for my grandchildren. I think that that will destroy this country's fabric and fiber if we allow that to continue. Piaget has a model of development <laughs> that is tangentially related to Levigotsky. Uh, only in that, Levigotsky had this one statement that said, children would like to play. <laughs> that he, Piaget took that one statement and developed a whole different model out of it. And it's probably something that most of our education system in the in past years, most of our pedagogy has been tied to. This notion that we have to have broadband to deliver content to students is a nonsense. What this is really about is, what this constant testing is about, is they are getting information on your kids and they are sending it back into the NSA database and don't doubt it for a minute. This isn't about teacher accountability. That's just the moniker behind the federal government to collect data on your kid. You can look at what's going on right now in Florida and in New York, and they were starting it in Indiana before they paused Common Core. They are doing psychometric research. They are hooking kids up to different machines and even MRI machines while they do different tests. It's crazy. It's nuts. This is stuff that is very intrusive, and they'll do it without parent permission because of the amendments to uh, the family, I guess the, the Parent Rights uh, Parent Information Act, I think it's called. So I, that's why I just reject Godsky's about the parent. Pat, would you like me to repeat the question? No, I have it actually written out. So. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and let me say, one of the things I really love about working on the Anchorage school system is besides it being a nonpartisan race, we've really got a nonpartisan committee. We have Republicans and Democrats and, and undeclared. Um, I have to tell you, I, don't, I work closest with the opposite side. I, I, I do. I always have. They question what party I should be on. Uh, and it doesn't matter. We agree based upon what we're trying to accomplish, what the issues are, and we don't extend it beyond that. I'm not going to use a name and say, be afraid. I think that's wrong. Now, I went and looked up the two names, and, and for the purposes of, I hate these pronouncing names, pronunciations, but Vygotsky, is that public? Vygotsky. Um, and it reads about uh, <coughs> social learning tends to proceed learning, um, social learning tends to proceed learning, and then, um, uh, and then the social interaction roles and all that. And so I looked at it from that standpoint, saying, okay, is it, are we asking people to learn at too early an age? I mean, I read that out there as one of the complaints about the um, uh, Common Core standards, Common Core State standards, is that we're asking kids at different levels to learn and they want to be developmental. Uh, we have Winterberry, which is the uh, Wardoff system, and it tends to focus that way, it tends to both social development before the learning, and it does that. And I talked to the principal today about that, and the response was, Pat, this is probably the best thing that ever happened to us because it's getting in to deeper, th uh, deeper thought skills and, and processing skills, and that's what we're all about. So it combines beautifully with them. It's kind of interesting. I thought that might be a, a problem area. Uh, but they see it just the opposite. Um, Anchorage is a, is a leader in the social emotional learning. I mean, I listen to radio broadcasts coming out of Ohio, Ohio saying, how come we can't be like Anchorage? We incorporate social and emotional learning in all of our classes because we have serious issues there. We have 22% of our kids are in poverty in this country. 
40% of the kids entering the state of Alaska in kindergarten are not prepared to learn in kindergarten. That shocks me. But what that basically means is when you come out of poverty, when you come out of areas where you don't have written language or issues around your home, you don't have people reading books, you, you don't have the development there, these kids are not even prepared in kindergarten to learn. So we've incorporated social emotional learning and we are having tremendous benefits out of it. In fact, the achievement gap between the social economic area, the last presentation I went to last month talked about 50% of that achievement gap with lower income and social economic areas is attributable to social emotional learning. Kids without that skill set, they, they are really in a difficult situation. That's one of the major factors that we deal with. So I focus on that within the group, and for evidence, I'll say the anchor school system. Our studies show it. We, can, we got evidence of it. We're proud of it. Uh, we're making the change. And I'm not, like I said, I am not afraid of throwing a name out there and saying you should be afraid. You better be afraid for your children. You better be afraid that they get the right kind of education and they get the information. There's no information here, gathering information in this process. They're coming out with four standards. They're working with it as a group. And I don't care who's involved with it at that point. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm getting a lot of grief this time. We'll begin again with you, Pat. Okay. I've got my questions. Go ahead, give it to me. Do you believe do you believe skills in the twentieth century are the same skills required for the twenty first century? <clears throat> if not, how should this impact public education? Well, Woody made a reference that 20th century education is a closet full of books. You needed to learn that. 21st century education is the ability to go out there, gather the information in the Library of Congress. You better locate information like that electronically, bring it back, process it, and apply it. And so that's impacting education in a lot of ways. One of the ways I talked about was social and emotional learning. Kids that are under high distress, their processing skills are impacted tremendously. In fact, studies show that that portion of the brain for some of these kids is actually physically smaller. There was a lot of studies out there showing that that's a big impact. Processing skills is critical. And if we don't address that issue, we're not going to be successful. Uh, so I see it as a tremendous shift that way. Half of all the jobs in 10 years are jobs we can't even imagine today because they don't exist. That's what they're telling us. That's what we should expect. From a human resources standpoint, that's where we're headed. <coughs> Things are changing rapidly. They are not changing fast now, but they will be changing fast later. Even though it looks like they're changing fast now, I think you're going to see rapid change here in the near future. We have to prepare kids for an uncertain future. We don't know what jobs will be there. When I'm growing up at my particular age, the average person change jobs every 18 months. That's what the studies show. What is the next generation going to do? They're going to change career fields six or seven times. Not jobs, career fields six or seven times. They've got to have the basic skills there to not only do a job coming out, but to be able to change to jobs in the future. And the way those jobs are going to be done is going to be dramatically different. And they're going to be perpetual students if they're going to be successful. They have a, they have going to have one hell of a challenge ahead of them. It's going to be difficult. But if we don't prepare them now for that, give them the processing skills to be able to change, to be able to grow, it's not enough to learn a job. We better learn how to learn jobs because it's going to be changing rapidly. And that's what I think the Common Core Standards is all about. It's using the knowledge you've got, being able to acquire new knowledge and apply it. And that's a lot different than what we've had when I was growing up. Barbara, would you like me to read the question to you again? Sure. Okay. Do you believe skills in the 20th century are the same skills required for the 21st century? If not, how should this impact public education? I I firmly believe many skills, many skills are timeless. Okay. Are, right. are, are timeless. timeless. The ability to read, write, you should be able to do that with any technology. Yeah. Be able to compute, know what a square root is, know what the Pythagorean theorem, know what mean medium mode is, know what right angles are. These are things you have to know. You don't need to look them up on a laptop or on a calculator. You get the finest calculator in the world is above your, two sh above your shoulders. All right, and if that's properly programmed, you should be able to survive. During the time that I have lived in my life, all right, I have learned how to write with a pen and paper. I have learned how to type with a manual typewriter in a very hot room with an electrical tape covering the keys because I kept looking at them, okay? And I had to remember the little boards. I had great shorthand, 
Ah, there's a skill that's gone the way of the dodo, right? But how many of you in high school heard, if you don't do break shorthand, you will have a career in the future? All right? How many of you just remember dictaphone skills? Oh, my gosh, yeah. When was the last time you had to take dictaphone, huh? <laughs> when was the last time you saw that as a job requirement? Really? <coughs> He's right, we don't know. Let me tell you what, some skills never change. Well, very, change very little. And I can go back to the very beginning of the Republic, and I can find those same skills were being taught. In fact, it's very interesting. If you can go back and look at eighth grade tests from the 1800s and 1900s, they're actually much harder than what's in the high schools today. All right? And that's because we've gotten away from things. James Milbrook, who was on the validation committee for the Common Core, said the one reason why California <coughs> went to a, the housing collapse that it went into is because they quit teaching compounded interest in middle school in California. True. And he takes responsibility for that because he was the one that altered that curriculum. He said that in testimony in the state of Indiana on their, on their standards. What's in those standards is very, very important. But what's more important is that the students learn it without the technology and then be able to use the technology to extend that knowledge. All right? I am sick and tired in this state of people, of kids being taught to use a calculator instead of doing the math. They need to know their math tables. And that's not happening. And you can change from Common Core to Dick City Doodah. And unless you get somebody sit down and start to teach the math, that's what's, that's what's happening. You have teachers only, oh, yes, we'll go get a newfangled who do who, Dad. And, you know, teach the tables, teach reading and writing, teach the phonics, teach, you know, vocabulary. Let's get back to the very basics. You know, my generation did not have Common Core. My generation did not have a uh, whole language. My generation didn't have all that stuff. But we survived the manual typewriter, the reel-to-reel, -reel, a track CD, wings, computers. I mean, gosh, you remember when us women, we weren't able to be trusted with a computer and they had a wang? Anyway, sorry. Um, but, yeah. Learning information. needs to be, this is the computer. I can tell we should have invited this on a TV. It was blue, and I looked at you know, okay, the red okay. the red blends in her best. That's not a skis. Okay. That's I'm sticking with that. Okay. So Barbara, we're starting with you this time. What solution do you propose to ensure that students transferring between schools and often states, such as children of our military, are properly prepared for their next grade level? I was very happy to get this question because last year I brought my grandkids up here from the state of Tennessee because, you know what, they have the Common Core. And guess what? They came up here and they were two years behind. Their mama wanted to know what they had to do. She saw how far behind her oldest one was. Guess what? The whole family picked up and moved down up here. They got here in February. Guess when we adopted the Common Core in the state? April right after they closed their house. <coughs> so, effort to get away from Common Core, where do you move? It finds you. Um, Tennessee is currently having hearings now, though, to get rid of them. Because what happened is that test scores fell by two years. The state of Minnesota test scores fell, and by the, everybody's two years behind. And guess what? They only adopted it in language arts. They didn't adopt the math standards. So, you know, there's a lot of, Track of the question. Oh, um, what should we do about the transfer? Students transferring. Well, uh, historically, well, I'll tell you what, historically, what has happened, I don't know what they do in Anchorage, but in North Pole, they have a little set aside school, little charter <coughs> school that was given two stars this year, but it's a good school. It's a transition school. If you're going from homeschool to high school and you want your kids to have that transition year, they have a program. They also help. They, it's a good place when you when the military moved. For example, when the colonels voted came, there was a little uh, little difference in the standards. The uh, Alaska standards, at least in North Pole High, were far more rigorous than what they were where she had been before on the Common Core standards. 
serve the North to do all the transition work to help them transition up into our standards. So again, Alaska. Everybody says, oh, our standards were the worst in the nation, blah, blah, blah. Folks, still in the kitchen. I, there's a kid after kid who's come up in, in, in the interior, okay, where we don't have the common core and have not had it, that we're behind, okay, when they moved up there. Okay, this isn't about Alaska standards being lousy. This is about the military kids transferring up here and not, this is in a common core state. They came out of a common core state, so guess what? They're behind. Am I right? No. You're, oh, you're, okay. You have time. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, but that's, but, what's, stop. but that's really what's going on here. And yeah, I will right. stop. Because we, really, that's ultimately what's going on here. You don't, you, this is a very small part of the population. I get it in Anchorage that you have this huge fluid in and out dynamic, I don't know why, probably because it's a port town. Um, you know, when you're on an ocean port, you have a lot of transition. You know, in the interior, it's a lot more stable population, I think. And, you know, that's, it's not that big of an issue. But you just had a transition school for them. Very simple. Pat Higgins, what solution do you propose to ensure that students transferring between schools in open states, such as children of our military, are properly prepared for grade level? You know, in Anchorage, we had a school where the seventh grade teachers, eighth grade teachers wanted to kind of switch what they were covering in material. And they kind of got away with that, too. And you kind of think about how those kids going from one school to the other got impacted. When the, we had a recent change in superintendents. When they came in, they said, you aren't even aligned in this, in the, in here. You've got kids changing schools, and they aren't covering the material at the same time, and they don't come out with the same skill sets in third grade and fourth grade. How can they be successful? So the very first thing we had to do was do an alignment and talk about teachers and say, this is the level, these are the skill sets you need, and this is what you need to go. And the military is one of the ones in the groups in here participating in the development of these things. And while the state of Alaska had the opportunity to participate in the Common Core Standards, Governor Cornell chose not to do it. Anchorage participated anyway when we got 40% of the kids in regards to developing these Common Core Standards. Now, without having some type of uniformity in Anchorage across the board where kids are going, and we have a lot of poverty there. We have kids that are in the north part and they, parents may save up money to be able to get an apartment first month, last month, and a security deposit, and then six months later if they get kicked out, they saved enough to go someplace else in the south part of Anchorage. We've got a lot of mobility going on. We have a lot of poverty going on. We have a lot of change. But when we've got that kind of situation, we need to better support it. Multiply that in the country. We solved it, we're solving it now in Anchorage by recognizing that we didn't have alignment of, of what we were doing, of the standards, of the skill sets, so that they're ready for the next grade. Do that throughout the whole country. If you're in the military and you're wondering about your child, um, you know, this has been a problem that's been around a long time. My wife was an Army brat, she was up here in the 50s. When they left here, they went to White Sands. You can imagine the kind of clientele they had there in the schools. They were pretty smart. Um, and it was a dramatic change. But our standards are so low compared to theirs that with the grade level, she was way behind. Um, if they came here, they'd be way ahead. Um, we can't have some type of, of rigorous, clear, well-defined standards so that when you go from one school to another school, even if the curriculum's different, you at least have the skill sets to be successful in the next grade. And if you're talking about mobility in the country, and we are a very collective society, we have skills that we are transferring all over the place, we move around all over the place. Next week I'm working in Fairbanks. I've worked all over. I've, I've commuted from here to Connecticut. I have done a lot of different things. And that's what type of society we have. And when you've got people changing jobs and locations, it's going to be difficult. Um, if we all stayed in the same school, be nice. We have a school like that. Polaris. Polaris has very low turnover. It's one of the top high school performing in the country. Top 100. 100% graduation this year, just like last year and they're doing exceptionally well. If you don't have any turnover, it's great. You can do it. But when you've got people moving about, you see the scores from there. And if we don't have people ready at one skill to move to the next, and that can't be done just in one city, then we're not going to get there. And that's what it's all about within this group. Right? And I see the red. I know you can. And I was giving you extra time to catch up. Given the enormous, oh, I'm sorry, Pat, this is for you. Given the enormous fiscal crisis that the rest of Alaska faces in terms of pensions, heating costs, health care, water quality, and soil contamination, what is the implementation of the core curriculum and broadband 
or why, I'm sorry, is all of the implementation of the core curriculum and broadband a critical priority? We're not changing the curriculum at all. We've said that before. Anchorage isn't changing a bit. We've got Go Math. We're going to continue with Go Math. We've got charter schools that have different things. They are not being told to change it. We have got optional programs. They are not changing. So we don't have any costs, costs, costs that are associated with any curriculum because there is no national curriculum. There's a, nat there's a common core state standard. There are skill sets that need to be done, and there was some movement in regards to the expectations that you're going to complete it every grade. But we're not changing books at all. Now, in regards to broadband and the IT aspects, I, you know, I watched a presentation last night that we can save $9 billion a year if we start going to electronic books. That's a lot of money in education. Uh, a whole lot. And there's a lot of other changes like that. So there was a lot of emphasis here on, on the role of IT because when you get out of, of, of school and you get employment, IT is going to be there. It's getting bigger, it's becoming dominant, and very few people here probably don't have a cell phone with a computer capability to it. So it's, it's out there, we may as well get adjusted to it. Uh, and it's there. Now, I'll, uh, we'll use this opportunity with, before the flag comes up to address the issue of calculators. I will say that when we're teaching at elementary school, calculators, but math, we're not using that, we're using math. But I had, went to a pre-calc class, and, I, and they were trying to get focused on high-level skills, okay? And I saw a presentation using one of the smart boards type thing, I want to see what's going on, and the teacher covered a whole semester in, a, in just a one period. I couldn't believe it, you know, but it was so easy with a smart board to go through this, and kids were following it. And so it came to a point about calculations and all. He said, look, you can program this, you can do this. And they said, we don't have to write out everything we multiply. And I said, no, at this level, we want you to do something higher. He said, I was about ready to drop the class, but no, I'm glad I kept it. You know what? In real life, that's what happens. If I go work somewhere, I'm allowed to pick up a calculator. I know how to do the math. I've already demonstrated it. I've already done it. But I have to get that higher level skills. I remember a teacher, a principal, making a comment that, you know, they always send the kids to, to the class, to the principal, if they forget their pen. And the teacher saying, well, in real life, you've got to have a pen. And the principal says, in real life, I shows up at Fred Myers, and I need to write a check, they give me a pen. You know, we don't disrupt education that way. Things are changing. I'm not going to support the idea that it isn't there. Of course we're teaching algebra. Of course we're teaching multiplication and division. But if you're asking whether or not we spend 80% of the time in a pre-calculus class, Writing out and multiplying it, not using a calculator, we use a calculator. And I think I'm, we're in the right approach because that's what you're going to find if you go anywhere else. Barbara, are you ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Given the enormous fiscal crisis that the rest of Alaska faces in terms of pensions, heating costs, health care, water quality, and soil contamination, why is the implementation of the core curriculum and broadband a critical priority? Um, I don't think it is. Right. Okay. I'll just let me, I'm going to briefly touch on something he said at the end about the calculator. Because we're not talking about kids using the calculator to go 3 times 4 equals 5. We're talking about programming the whole calculator. And then they didn't want to solve a problem. So when they took a college entrance exam, where they couldn't use the calculator, they would bomb because they didn't know how to solve it. That was what was going on, and I know because I interviewed every one of the kids. All right, and that's, I can tell you the names of the teachers who were teaching it that way. And I had my letters on file with the Fairbanks School District on that. The, um, I want to talk a lot, of, though, about the cost of what's going on. I'm glad the Anchorage School District has got all the books they need, and they're all hunky dory and ready to go. That's not the case in the rest of Alaska. Right now, when you look at the teacher's pension fund alone, only 30 cents on the dollar, I believe, is in the bank funded. We have an unfunded liability of 70%, uh, is what I was told. That was the statistics that I got. And when I saw that, I was rather flabbergasted. I knew we had some problems with actuarials in the state, but I didn't realize the numbers were that bad. And they are. We're number one in the nation uh, for unfunded pension liabilities per capita. Okay, that's a lot of money. We're going to be paying out, all right? Uh, we've got a few cities in the interior. One's got some soil contamination issues. That's North Pole. Another one that's got some water issues, and that's Nenana, okay? I don't want to go into the details of all that stuff. But when you look at those communities, like they take, let's take Nenana, for example, you got a water problem, you're teetering, you're breaking debt, and you want me to spend what? 
$900,000 a month on operating expenses for broadband. Okay? Oh, and I talked to Delta Junction, and I can't even keep a phone call to stay. And, you know, whenever I call there, it takes four tries to see a phone call through. And you know they don't have the broadband capabilities, so are they supposed to spend $900,000, which is what satellite backhaul costs, according to ACS, on your sworn testimony, $900,000 a year, an academic year, that's for the nine-month calendar. You know, I can do a lot of things with $900,000. And I'm just wondering which teacher is going to give up their pension so that the districts, yeah, everybody's looking at me like, huh, what? I'm going to give up my pension. I, you earned it. You shouldn't give it up. Mm -hmm. But those are the kind of fiscal choices that are coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. You know, broadband's a great thing, but, you know, it's not everything. And you are looking at people who have hu other huge needs, indoor plumbing, water, Heat, all of you who live, you know, who live in the interior, some of you know what we're going through with heating costs, okay? I mean, shouldn't we be spending money in the state of building that LNG facility instead of uh, wiring everybody for fun games and education? So, anyway, that's where I'm kind of at. I don't think it's a wise investment right now. And if we do it, I hope the Department of Education is not running it. She heard me. Barbara, you're yes. up again. Yes, ma'am. Do you believe, and I believe this is the Common Core Standards System, do you believe CCSS will impact involvement of parents in a positive or negative manner? I think initially it'll all be kind of positive because it's new and exciting and everything new and exciting is wonderful and new and exciting. And then the reality sets it. And I don't know what's going on in the Anchorage School District, but I know in other school districts in other parts of the United States, the teachers are being told not to even talk about it. All right? In California, they've got teachers who are, have actually have litigation ongoing because they were reprimanded for talking to a parent about Common Core. Not even saying whether it was good or bad, just explaining what it was. And that was kind of, I thought, it's kind of a quirky case. We'll see what happens uh, as that case progresses. There's another case where there was the, actually somebody who was the attorney sitting on the certification board um, is presently, at right now, suing the state of California because I guess some of the people who are sitting on the board actually worked for some of the companies that were, that had, things adopted. So California is going to be a very interesting state to watch because there's a lot of litigation right now involving what's going on with Common Core, with teachers and vendors. Apparently what happens is when they go to, when the students don't make the test scores, they don't make the cut, okay, so this is what's happened in a few places. They shut down the whole school and I guess in Chicago they have a huge protest going on right now. They shut down the school, they fire the teachers, they fire the principal, they shut the whole thing down, and I guess they, they contract out to a private entity to teach. And some of them are like, for example, the Khan Academy, they hire all Turkish teachers, they don't even hire Americans, and they come in and kind of, I guess it's called insourcing, where you bring internationals in to teach your children. And it's, if you tell Folks, before you, you see down the road, go look at what's going on in the other states who have been in this for two years, okay? Just don't go by what's going on in Anchorage. Anchorage hasn't had the full Common Core. Don't, don't get me wrong, he's a nice guy. They didn't even know that there are appendices to the Common Core and what's in those appendices. And if you read the blue aside, which is in the literature exemplar for the 11th grade, and you tell me you can read that out loud with your child without getting disgusted, then you're better, then you're made of something different than I am. Because let me tell you what, I couldn't read about that. Pat, do you believe CCSS will impact involvement of parents in a positive or negative manner? 
I think it's, it's important for parents to have a clear understanding of what their child is supposed to learn that year and have a clear understanding of what the school district is trying to do. In Anchorage, because we've stopped the, we've adopted really the, the common core uh, state standards and we've taken that, we've, we've gone beyond, the, we did that before the, while the state was sitting on the sidelines on that. We went forward with that. Um, we've got all of our schools aligned and so we have, and I put back in the back, actually here's a, a parent roadmap to English, but we have one for every grade because essentially we could share with them these are the accomplishments we expect your child to learn. These are things you can do, these are ways you can support it. So you've got it for first grade, you know what's going to happen in second grade and third grade, all the way up to twelfth grade. You get documents out there and you've got the support for it. Teachers have aligning their curriculum so that their activities are going to meet those expectations. I was at an um, academy with teachers that attended statewide that were all engaged in this, trying to get this done. So they can communicate as a consistency. And if, the, and if a parent moves from different locations, they still understand what the expectations were. Because even though we wouldn't have written it, the same concepts are there for them as well. But we, got, we have the ability now for parents to be more informed of what we're trying to accomplish, the skill sets those shops have to have at every grade. I think that's important. And if they transfer, if they change, then maybe they'll stay in the same area for 13 years for K-12. But the probability is there's a good chance they may move. Different schools, maybe different cities or different states, they still have some continuity. And they still have the ability to know that their child is on level and they can still be successful. I think that's a very important issue from my standpoint. Doesn't direct what you're going to have for curriculum. And I'll mention one thing about the cost, because the cost of the testing is $22 with the consortium. I mean, that's the, that's the cost of what we do. It's less than the others. It's usually about two-thirds of what states are paying. And we're not coming out behind on that. But broadbanding, everywhere you go, you got computer costs. And this is no different. And so, of course, there's going to be costs. Um, but we're already incurring it, and I'm sure that other things and other schools are doing it as well. And the schools without it, they need it. They need it for those kids to be successful. Thank you to both of our presenters for the first question and answer period here at the evening. And please join me in. That was the prepared questions time of the meeting. I do have a question for you, Barbara and Kat. Um, I'm, the room is getting warmer. I'm wondering if you want to just take a five minute break, open the doors, and possibly take care Whatever of the comfort. Whatever they would like, I'm ready. Is anyone, would anyone care to take a break at this time? Okay, great. Then I will go ahead and let, I will start with Pat for their wrap up of the prepared question and answer period. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I think this is an extremely important issue. Um, I can't imagine anything more important than education and what our kids' future is going to be like. It is going to be a new world. It's going to be a changing world. It's one that's going to be tremendous challenges for our kids. Um, and to me, rigorous standards is just something you want to establish. We are going to live up to the standards we set for our kids. We're going to live up to the standards we set for our school. This is not going to be easy. I'm going to tell you that this spring we're going to be taking some initial testing, but next year it kicks in and look for the test scores to come down. Why? Because they're so rigorous, it's different, and it's going to take a while for us to make the adjustment. Because fifth grade didn't teach the levels needed for sixth grade with the new common core. We're going to play catch up. It's going to be a challenge. But the alternative is unacceptable for me. The alternative that we aren't going to set more rigorous standards is wrong for our kids. We owe it to them to make sure that they're prepared. We've heard from employers. I went to Chamber of Commerce. I'll go to the to Mayor's Conference with uh, uh, Sullivan, I'll go to different areas, they're all saying the same thing, you need more rigorous standards. This is unacceptable, we aren't happy with the outcome. I agree. I, I am frustrated with this, I realize that it's hard to do it in a vacuum. Trying to do it in one location, one school, or one district, it isn't going to accomplish what we're hoping to accomplish. We need to have a system fixed because public education is not achieving everything it needs to be done. There was too much involvement. And I've got to tell you, the cost is tremendous for failure. You know, uh, if you go to California, you see 75% of the people in prison have learning disabilities that weren't successful in school. You have linkage. We know how much money people make whether they graduate with the skills required or not. And, and we see in Alaska, the people graduating from college in four years after 
uh, completion of high school is second to, I think, Utah, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to put that back. But there was one state out there, Nevada or something, but, once, but other than that, we're at the bottom. We have not done a good job of that. We can do better. Our kids can do anything, and we can compete anywhere in the world. But if we aren't willing to invest in their future, we aren't investing right. Uh, it is just isn't going to cut it. There were bigger investment issues out there. Uh, I'll, I'll share one story. I used to attend Ted Stevens fundraisers, and I remember I had a chance to talk to him a lot of times, and he said, the secret to this, from his standpoint, early education, career technology. Teach them everything you can from birth until six years old and get out of the way. You know, and I like this approach. I've attended with Lisa Mikowski doing the Senate Subcommittee, school district, everything focused on early education, career technology, but, but the standards is what they both focus on too. They said the standards are too weak. You've got to be more aggressive on that. And we heard that. We've got to have more aggressive. And if we want to be competing in a new world, we need to put the emphasis there. We need to say that our kids are too important to say that we're second class citizens and we're not putting them out for the future. Thank you. Barbara, uh, hey, this is my summary, huh? This is your five minutes. More rigorous. No concept of the value of pi. No circle area of circumference. Time factorization, the fundamental theorem of mathematics, gone. Fraction and decimal interchangeability to percentages, gone. Division of fractions moved to high school level. Density measurement gone. Division moved to the sixth grade. Go to my website. I've got the first. I've got the sixth grade first two pages. The book they're using on, on my website. You can tell me if it's more rigorous. I like that word rigor. I like the fact that South Korea, who they throw in our face all the time, is having a more rigorous standard. Is using our old textbooks in mathematics. They took Alaska's old math books from the Hickel era and translated them, put them in a nice glossy, and now they get the highest standards. Hmm. You think it's standards? You think that's all of it? You think some of it might be teaching? Some of it might be enthusiasm for teaching? You think some of it might be somebody taking an interest in the kid? What is this socioeconomic goop that the parents are supposed to be doing? All right? The school is the mother and father now as well. What's that? Maybe that's how it is in Anchorage. And if it is, I'm truly sorry. But the rest of Alaska is not that far yet. All right, we still have parents who care, parents who are involved. Other than every once in a while, you'll see somebody's not keeping it together. But usually the community kind of steps up to the plate and helps out a little bit. Um, this whole notion that the Common Core is rigorous that is laughable, all right? We didn't have that weight of standards, you're right. But that doesn't mean that this is a superior approach, all right? Whenever you go with the herd, you, well, that's usually not the way to go, but even if so, you know, even if you didn't like the old standards, that doesn't mean the Common Core standards are the way to go. There's a lot better out there, and let me tell you what, the developmental inappropriateness of what's going on in, in having a century of reading and writing research overthrown by taking out the reading components throughout a literature, replacing it with writing and speaking, that's more rigorous. How is throwing the disius out of the curriculum more rigorous? How is throwing out you know, uh, so many of the good books, the analytical literature that teaches thinking skills. How is that better? Now we have informational texts. How long will it be before that informational text? You know, with a consortium, you've got the consortium communicating directly into the schools. So, you know, Obama wakes up one morning and he thinks everybody should be taught that an AR-15 was used in that Navy shootout, even though it wasn't. Uh, he could just put his little message down into the consortium, and the consortium puts it right into the schools, and guess what's the informational reading the next day or a day and a half later? Okay? The fact that the ice sheet has increased 67% doesn't matter to Barack Obama. We're going to all have green energy anyway, right? And he'll shove that information down. In fact, that's exactly what's going on right now. 
with the NGSS standards that are being adopted and that Smart and Balanced is incorporating that information into the literary area in the English class that would be in the testing materials. All right? You're not going to hear about the ice sheet increasing by 67%. You're going to hear about Vladimir Putin's going to come get us because the Arctic Ocean's open now. Yeah. It's still not open, folks, okay? Trust me, it's not, it's not open, okay? The ships are freezing in there. But that's the danger here, ultimately, is that you have the consortium and you have this setup that is really very dangerous. It's turnkey tyranny, like Ed Snowden said. One last item. It may be that the listed cost for SBAC is $22.70, but Michigan was paying $500 a student, which is why they defunded and left this consortium. Utah, uh, Wisconsin, um, Alabama, Georgia, Georgia was in part though, so let's we can set them aside. Uh, Vermont and Maine, Maine left by executive order, LePage, Governor LePage thought he was going to lose the referendum on withdrawing from the Common Core, my executive order he got out. $500 a kid, they were paying. Don't look at the list price, look at the real price. Once again, Thank you to both of our speakers for yeah. very yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now your turn to ask questions. I ask that you either stand or raise your hand, at least raise your hand, so that I may call on you to ask any questions that you have. You may direct your question to a specific presenter, or you can ask the question of both people. Please state before the question the person whom you're directing it at. Each speaker will have two to three minutes to respond. And also, please only ask a single question at a time. If we have time, I will go back for second questions. So is there anyone who has a question at this time? Kim? Or? Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Hayes, I have a question for you. I am wondering if you are familiar with the um, ACT Work Keys test. I'm sorry, say it again. I'm sorry. Are you familiar with the ACT Work Keys test? And if so, is this Work Keys Ready community thrust that I see happening in, within the Department of Labor, is this connected in any way to um, the Common Core? I can give you a short answer. Uh, I don't have the answer. Uh, I don't okay. know. Uh, I, I know that there's components there and there's questions, but I don't have the answer for it. It's one thing I could get back to you with, but I just don't have it right now. Thank you. Excuse me, Barbara indicates she may have an answer. I've taught EBE for a lot of years. Would you yes. like Barbara to answer? Yes, I love it. I've taught EBE for the Department of Labor for, a few, for quite a few years. I don't need more. What's but ABE? ABE, Adult Basic Education, okay. which is GED. Okay. Right. And yes. It is. It is connected? Yeah. It's the same work piece test. And if you take a look at the new test, that, the testing steps that are required in the Department of Education, and Lynn, am I right about that? That work keys is still required? That's where the, what they call it the crossover uh, effect. That's where you take that. That's actually for um, performance scholarship and also for Department of Labor does some diagnostics with it as well. So, in becoming a work ready community, what would be the danger in using that tool? Oh, this isn't about work keys. No, I know. Okay, so there wouldn't be. Okay, that's what I'm trying <laughs> to say. This isn't about sure. work keys. This is about the common core. No, no, no. The, uh, no. Smarter balance test is not in any way connected to work keys. Oh, that's why I asked. Oh, I thought you okay. asked it was. Okay. No, I thought you asked the work keys test that was offered in the school is the same as the work keys test in the Department of Labor. That's what I thought you meant. That's why yeah, they probably are the same. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, those tests are the same. Okay, but I'm wondering, is, is that connected to Common Core in any way? Because I, I don't think it is, but I want to, because there's going to be a presentation tomorrow where a lot of people that are here are going to be hearing about it. So I wanted to. Where's that at? It's going to be at Evangelism's. It is by invitation, but if you're in, oh. interested, you can. Yeah. Should I invite it? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Um, I guess I have a question for Mr. Higgins. Uh, if I move closer, I uh, 
had a set of hearing aids that were out of whack, so they were off to the shop, and so we will get closer to here. Thank you. We, we talk a lot about how modern times or the new age requires yeah. a change in our education system. Uh, under the older education system, let's say the local control education system, this country went from horse and buggy to moon landing. And in my act of moon landing, we invented the Department of Education. Been down ever since. Have an on that? You know, um, I, I think back over the progression from the standpoint of education, I tried to look at it a little bit and I said, okay, 1900, what percentage of the population graduated high school? Um, 6%. They became the managers, they became all the others. Uh, when I was in high school, I graduated in 1970. You know, it looks like a more 1990, but it's really 1970. And, and at that time, they didn't try to make sure everybody graduated from high school. I mean, it was really kind of a, they didn't have an inclusion, they didn't have the same thing. And so I'm not sure that I recommend that it's declining in quite the same way. I think the expectations have gone up and the, and the, and the progress hasn't kept up. And the expectations today coming out of high school, it doesn't meet the expectations of work. Some things are still there. I mean, one of the problems I had with Anchorage was it wasn't focused on pure technology. We still need electricians, we still need all kinds of things, <coughs> and, and we weren't putting the money into that, and we are doing that now. We're building new, new places and all that kind of stuff. But I'm not sure that the, the, it's linked to any one issue, of what I'm trying to say, in the regards to education. education is actually yes, sir, right? yeah. Do you believe that the Department of Education is actually right? Do you think it's a game? Bill, please stop. Oh, oh excuse me. I'm and just wait to... till we've gone through the rest of the room. Okay, <laughs> Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm an 82-year-old retired teacher, and the reason I came is I'm really concerned about the future of education in this country. And I have a question that I want to ask of both of you. Every new thing that comes along, believe me, I've been through a lot of them. I taught in Indiana, and I taught in Alaska for 30 years, villages, Wasilla, when there were 100 students in the high school in Anchorage and lots of places and I've taught all grades and I have uh, certification for a counselor at every level and principal at every level. But what I'm listening to of concerning our children today is something that really disturbs me and it is the fact that we want these expectations of what I kept hearing when we we're listening to No Child Left Behind, was it okay, everybody's on the same page every day, and, you know. We have to take into consideration that we're not producing a product that comes off a line. We're dealing with human beings, and these children are all different. They learn in different ways. Uh, they learn at different rates. And to me, there has been entirely too much testing of the wrong things, how much knowledge they have here or here or here. What we need to learn today is how to live in the world with a lot of people that don't think the way we do. And that can only be learned by teaching um, and giving children the uh, opportunity to have um, learn about critical thinking, about mm -hmm. how to discuss and talk to people and disagree with people without calling names, without. Excuse um, me, Ron, do you have a question? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying this is what I'm worried about. And how do you see that each of these ways of teaching is going to accomplish taking the child where he is, which I did for over 30 years, and taking him as far as he can go in whatever situation that was. And if so much time is spent on teaching to the test, the children are getting lost. And our schools, Yes. what do you think that we should have every child graduating expecting to go to college, or should we 
recognize that there are many, many wonderful jobs that we should be training them for and not spending so much time focused with these high expectations for everybody, but expecting what children are capable of doing, what they want to do. And how does each of those, well, I don't know what to call them because I have a problem with fancy names for teaching children, teaching school. But how is Common Core going to do that? How is what I'm hearing from you, I, I, I believe in local control. I have no problem with that. But I do believe that sometimes somebody out there knows something that everybody should be studying and that we should, in my opinion, be studying a lot of science to keep this world here. But how are each of us? Oh, I can answer that all this week. Thank you. I think Pat went last and I'd like to have a box up there. Okay. Uh, you know, if you go back and you really think about book control, you know, really, if you go back and think about it, there was a shared content everybody did end up knowing. Really, quite frankly. I, you know, if you go back, we didn't have a national standard or national anything, but there was a national agreement in many respects on. You know, by the, by the time you graduated high school, you should know how to add, subtract, multiply, divide. You need, you, there's certain things. You, you understood how government worked. So, you know, we didn't have to codify all that in terms of a, a consortium and rigorous testing, okay? You, and you can't, you know, you can pass all the laws you want, you have all the standards you want, but a kid's going to learn it the right kid learns. You cannot legislate scope and sequence. I said that during No Child Left Behind. Every child learns at a different rate. Some will learn at the government approved rate, and others won't. Okay? That's how it is. And that doesn't mean they're less of a person. In fact, I think that's why I have a problem with testing, testing, testing. It's because it, it takes those folks who are not lockstep developmentally and makes them feel worthless. And they're not. I, I guess I believe in God. God gave us diversity. <coughs> and I think God likes diversity. Now, now I, I think you're right. And I think, you know, we did a great job in education without all this testing, testing, testing in the 70s. I think that was the height of, of, of education. You have a low student-teacher ratio. You get to know the kids. You know? And focus on learning. And if they didn't get this year, look at it next year. Can we give Pat a check? First of all, thank you for your career of teaching. I, I appreciate that. You've touched a lot of people's lives. I, I know you know that. And it, it, it's, it's a big contribution to where we were today. So thank you. Uh, I am uh, a parent with three kids that went to Montessori school system. Montessori within Anchorage. Uh, I believe in the Montessori approach. It works for me. Uh, I have a child who is dyslexic at kindergarten, uh, in the middle of the semester, uh, first semester, he couldn't read, he couldn't do it all. And then we sand papers, letters, and send it that, he was reading at second grade level. Every kid learns differently, and that's critical. That's why I love the optional programs, I love the charter schools, I love the options out there for it. My goal this year, and it'll be coming out there Monday, we're getting into it, is expand those programs. I'd like to have Montessori in about a half a dozen schools in Anchorage next year, and I know we can expand the True Batch Optional, which is our top performing, a bunch of others. Parents want it, we ought to be responsive. We aren't trying to dictate, when we talk about teaching to the test, we're talking about learning the skill sets. It's more critical thinking. We need the critical thinking. We don't have to have it out of textbook A, B, or C, but we have to have the ability to use math and not just be able to fill out a math formula. And we have to make sure that the second graders are ready for third grade. And too often, I don't know what grade you taught, but I'm sure you had children coming into your school in your grade that wasn't prepared. Uh, if, if it's like any place else, it has to be that way. And, and that's not, that's what we've got to prevent. We've got to do something for intervention. Now in Anchorage, we really all focus on social emotional learning. That means we're focused on kids being able to get along with others. We're trying to work together teamwork. We're trying to teach them social skills that, I'm sorry, they haven't gotten at that particular point where they need to develop more. 
uh, coming from poverty is a much higher probability, but no matter where they come from, it's the skill set they need and is critical for their success. So we are focused on that. We are also focused on response to intervention, response to instruction. We are identifying the high-risk kids, we are putting other resources, we are taking them out and putting them in different areas before they fail. I think it's one of the better programs we've got. It's critical. It's along those lines. But none of these are really being in any way affected by common core state standards. We're still going to maintain the same program. We're still going to maintain social emotional learning. We're still going to maintain all those approaches. Does the teacher have to teach material to the test? No, but they've got to teach the skills associated with that test. There was a difference there. You need to walk out, you need to be able to write. I don't care what books you've read, but you have to be able to write. You have to be able to read. Your vocabulary needs to be higher than what it is today. And we need to make sure that when you look at math, you know what the math means. You know how to apply it, you know you can use it. Because right now, all studies and the issues out there from employers and colleges is that isn't the case. And we want to be ready from grade to grade. But it doesn't dictate curriculum. You, every place will be different. Mr. McLean, then, Ms. Obar. Sir, I think you have uh, Robert, can I ask you to please stand? Sure. We can't well, I think you have indicated that Alaska lab, uh, was at least some of the lower 48. Uh huh. And you said that Common Core doesn't necessarily impact the curriculum. But why then does it take an outside group to elevate these standards that you're trying to achieve? Why can't you do it in Anchorage? That's half the state. Why don't you just, it, don't we have the competence to, you know, to achieve that without, say, going to somebody in Washington or somebody in you know, lower 48? Why, do, why settle for Parity, why not? So, for excellence. I think the national, anytime you nationalize something, and I've had some familiarity with federal programs, I think anytime you nationalize something, you don't in, uh, institutionalize excellence. I think you institutionalize mediocrity. <laughs> States have signed on to this. The uh, military education activities groups have signed on Washington DC. I mean DC, Washington DC, and, and the four territories I think are all signed. And not every state. It's something that came from the states. It didn't come from the national down. It came from the states and, and the governors who said we have a problem. And I think the problem is that to come up with standards, what standards did they need, put the resources into it, it made more sense that the states would cooperatively together. That's my, that's the way I view it. Uh, I don't view this as something that is dictated. We do not, it, it's, it's coming in, not all states signed on to it. We've altered it, but it's very limited altering. I agree with Barbara that essentially the, what Governor Cornell did was not voice anything in Alaska, and afterwards then adopted something, changed a few words, and then went forward with it. It's really not much different. But, you know, back to the question, I don't think it's, it's, down, it's down driven. I think Anchorage recognized that we need higher standards, but we need standards that are consistent with where we need to be, and they're working together to do that. And I think the states have signed off on that, saying, look, working together makes more sense. We, like I said, I do think we're a transient population. I think that's going to become more so. Did I not answer the question? Well, how working together makes more sense? I mean, what are they going to tell you that you don't know? I mean, what is it that they're going to offer you that you don't have? I think the resources of working together are tremendous. Just like the consortium of generating the test is issue, it's a resource issue. It takes a lot of resources to develop the Common Core, the testing, and the like, and the states have come together to do it. We haven't been able to measure outcomes in Alaska versus other states either. And so they sort of benefit that way of looking at the value of world we are. And I think they said the consistency that the standards we need in Alaska for people going to college is the same as any other state. We really want people ready going to college, to career ready, for jobs. They're really the same thing. So let's set standards high nationally, but do it from the state level standpoint. And so it didn't get driven from the state, it got driven from the governors, which I think is the appropriate way it should have been done. Dr. Haney, would you like a minute to respond? I would, yes. The, actually, I want to talk directly about the comparison of the states. This common, this smart balance test used adaptive technology. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with adaptive technology. Adaptive technology means, like, say, for example, 
Uh, the question's four plus four. You know, we all know the answer's eight. Well, say you put six. Oh, you got it wrong. So what they're going to do is they're going to come back and they're going to ask you the same question again. What's four plus four? <laughs> you know, maybe this time instead of four flowers and four flowers, it's four eggs and four eggs. What's the answer? You put six. They'll keep asking you that. Those questions cannot be compared across states. They can't even be compared across cities. Those, these tests are not aimed at comparing results of Anchorage versus uh, Portland. Okay, just, I'm just speaking a random city. That, that's not what these tests are designed for. They are designed to test student <coughs> achievement along the long, the long, the lifelong, lifetime long of that student. They cannot, they don't have comparability. The adaptive technology vitiates cross-sectional comparisons. Hammond will tell you that, the lady who wrote the test. So will um, Jim, um, whatever his name is, the other guy who runs uh, West End, who's the PMP, the consortium consultant. All right, they'll both tell you that. Sorry. Gretchen, I called on you next, and I'll try to make it very even quick. I had eight children. We sat and figured out one time with the extra teachers in middle school and high school that I had contact with probably over 150 teachers. Some of them were spectacular teachers. A few of them were horrible, and they were. Even a teacher in Eagle River who was later removed by the Anchorage School District, so I know. Um, and please, no offense to the good teachers out there, because there are. But you're talking about standards to be enforced for the children. What are we going to do with the power of the NEA, excuse me, and being the ten teacher's tenure, about standards for the teachers. Not just standards for the children, for the teachers. Part of the problem is, because I had kids who could learn anything from a good teacher. A lousy teacher, they immediately started going the other direction. So that's the problem is, is your question directed to Mr. Higgins or both of them? It's to you, you one of them, or both. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, Pat, you're first. I like the question. Um, you know, in, in 2010, one of the things that Anchorage did, my initiative that got voted on by the board, is that we take a measurement beginning and middle at the end of the year of the academic growth of every child. Because if we're going to do something, we're going to evaluate people, we need to first start off by saying what's important that we measure. And we need to see that kids are learning in that classroom. And if they aren't learning, we need to look at why and we need to take some type of action. In some cases, is helping the teacher be successful. That's really the first step. And there's nothing wrong with that. We've got some issues. It's new to the teacher. That's fine. And if we don't address it, if we don't look at what the problem is, we don't take actions on it, then it's our fault. But we haven't been doing that. We've always heard the explanation, I'll be honest, but from, from an education standpoint, is that there are so many variables involved in education, you can't look at academic outcomes. I'm not, I'm, I tell you, I'm a manager. I'm not a teacher. I don't buy that. Uh, if something's important, you measure it, you hold people accountable. Too much is at stake with the, with the, with the teachers. And so we've worked with the NEA, by the way, we've worked with the teachers, uh, the Alaska uh, uh, Education Association, on coming up with new systems for evaluation. I know the state's looking at a new system in regards to requiring a percentage based upon academic. Um, and we're focused on that. Uh, I think it's important. Now, there are factors that may be associated with that that we have to take into account. We've got a great teacher, does a fantastic job, so they give them every special education child. Uh, or every troubled child, or we got some classrooms that are just, you know, are, are stacked differently with different students. We need to look at that. We can't just take numbers and use it. But we've got to look at the numbers, and we haven't been doing that. It was my frustration when I got on the board. We've had almost little in regards to any reaction to, 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 to separations or changes in, in teachers, even though we knew we had some low-performing schools and low-performing classrooms. We now are getting more data, and now we can use it. And I think that's critical. To, the, to making the system work. But in doing so, we have to be fair to the teachers. When they have low results, we need to look at why, and we need to then take some intervention to do that. And that's part of the response to instruction. We've got to do, we've got to step in and say, we own the problem when we do it. Barbara, three minutes to answer. It's always a problem for me when I hear somebody from the government you're stepping going to have in. to stand up because I think I'm the only one who understands what you're saying. I'm always bothered when I hear somebody from the government saying they're going to step in and tell my family how things are going to be run. Uh, that's always troublesome, so it takes me a second to collect my thoughts from there. Um, teacher education. I think this is an important topic. I think for far too long, teachers have been, 
I hate to say it, but anybody who goes to college knows that elementary ed is about where it is, okay? That's the last, but it's like that's the last major, right? But if you can't get through that, then it's you're easy out. Yeah, it's the easy out. It's, yeah, we maybe there needs to be some changes there. I'm going to tell you something too. There's a lot of people in this state who are being locked out of the education profession on that same issue. Okay, I'm going to give you a real good example. I got a good friend who has a mathematics degree from MIT, PhD in MIT, mathematics. Do you know what the Fairbanks School District has in teaching? Autistic children who are fairly physically functional. They won't put them in a mathematics classroom. And yet, he is one of the best mathematics teachers I've met. Okay? No, it's not, it's, they haven't, he goes out, he supervises people who wash windows in job training. It's, he wants to be in the math classroom. That's not where they're going to put him. You want to know why? Because I have his degree in, in, in education, he has his degree in mathematics. All right? All right, well, there's a point in this state where we're going to have to sit down and say, if you have your PhD in a field, can you teach in that field, in that, in that, in that state? Or do you have to have, go and get, go back to college and get the degree in elementary and secondary education? <coughs> you know, somebody my age, by the time I go back and do that, I'm going to be old enough to retire. So why do I go back and get another college degree? You know, I'm going to teach economics? I have to go teach. Well, I taught for years of college. Oh, no, you've got to go get an elementary, you've got to go get a secondary education degree. Well, so, <laughs> forget it. By the time I get done with that, I'll get more debt than I ever made at the job. Not only that, I'll be retired by the time, I mean, I'll be eligible for Social Security by the time I'm done. So, it's a waste of time, you know. And yet, you have that talent being wasted. And I think that's a real good issue to take up. It's somewhere, some, at some point, um, in the certification process, that's my opinion. And I'm not sure that certification in its current structure is... Used to be the superintendent could uh, certify people, and they got rid of that. And I thought that was wrong. Go ahead. Um, I promised Lori next she was the next person to raise your hand, but I am going to limit the responses to one minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. The in-depth answers are a little bit much, and we are running late on the evening, and we have children in the hallway. I'm sure you will hear some reading soon. So, Lori, please. Sure. Feel thank free you, thank you so much. And, and I want to say um, thanks for coming to this tonight. I think it's a very important subject. I've been researching it for about the last year and a half. And during that time, I started contacting my local school board, asking if it was here in the Matsu. And through the research I did, I learned it is. Yeah. And that we, you take, and you look at your books, you take your children's school books, read them, read their social studies books. You would be totally amazed at who they're teaching your children about and who they're holding up as the heroes in our world That's today. Right. Yeah. I am raising a United I'm States a citizen and not a global citizen. Amen. That is who I want. I do not want a robot for a child. I don't want them to be taught like everybody else. I want them to learn on their own accord. So I think through the research that I have done, I have learned through Parnell signing in April to the SBAC, we are committed to doing the assessment testing. And through that, and through my research, in order for the assessments to work, curriculum follows testing, period. It does. Yeah. My question is this. I'm a very private person, and we all know where everything is going with the NSA and how everybody's snooping on everybody. I would like um, both, both uh, of our uh, speakers to talk to me about this, but also the P20 data that's through the colleges right now, P20, mm -hmm. through UAA and how much money they've gotten from the Gates Foundation and why they're not stepping up and doing anything about it, as well as the data mining and how far that goes into. I don't think it's the school's business at all to know what I do my religion, my political affiliation, or anything else, and you can best be assured they're going to be taking it to everybody, and it's and their things. They're going to share it with anybody they want. Thank you, so you guys sorry. I appreciate it. Yeah. So P20 and data mining. She's warning about P20 through the university go, schools, and how will follow you at this one. If you go to the Alaska Commission on Post Secondary Education, it's right there on the website. So it's actually they're the ones who are collecting, who are running the data, but the fiscal agent is the Alaska Department of Education. 
It was $1.6 million of our state money went to this, all right? And Parnell lifted some, made some executive orders to make it happen. Voter, your, your voter record is in there, your voting preferences. Not who you voted for, but you vote, whether you're registered Republican or Democrat, which to me is not a problem. I just don't see where it's any of the teacher's business. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether or not I got a permanent fund, well, you know, I mean, I guess it doesn't help take a whole lot for somebody to figure out I got one. But, you know, really, is it any of their business? All right? Should, I mean, you know what I'm saying? And it's my work. And, and guess, you know, if you are the grandmother of the kids living with you, guess what? They got all your business, too, now the P20 database is connected in. Uh, you know, I homeschooled my kids. They all went to private colleges. We just wanted to stay out of this whole government NSA thing. But, you know, it's there. Mr. Higgins, Pat. I remember a presentation at a community, at a, at a community event where somebody gave a, a, a spill about why they were posted. One of the comments was another program of Common Core is data mining where schools are poised to collect data for its blood type, religious affiliation, voting information, income, etc. There's nothing in the Common Core that's doing that. You may have some school district issues, you may have some other issues, but Common Core is based on coming up with certain standards, doing the testing, and then monitoring those results. There's nothing to do with blood type, there's nothing to do with religious affiliation, there's nothing there that says that this is tied in to somehow with Common Core. I don't understand that particular aspect of it. I don't have, there's no information where that comes from. Uh, but um, the idea that somehow or another we're worried about religious affiliation and the others. I can tell you, having worked in medical, and you've got people like Providence that's losing a computer with everything in the load on it, uh, with patients and other places, you've got data security issues that are out there all over the place, but there's nothing like that being gathered. Okay, I understand you want to respond, but I have lots of audience who wants to ask questions, and so I'll start with Jesse again. Okay, my question would be for, to Mr. Higgins. Have you looked at the GoMath curriculum? Have you read the scope and sequence and the teacher's lessons in all the grades? Because I have a very good friend in your school district who is trying to teach, and it's a horrible curriculum. She says it's supposed to go from lesson one to lesson 30 and then back to two again, and half of her class cannot understand the material because they needed that lesson two, but Common Core says they had to go up to these other lessons first and then it goes back again. As a teacher, I know that if a student doesn't get the material, you need to stop and you need to make them understand it before you move on. But she knows that she is tested, the kids are tested, and if they fail, she's docked her pay. So she can't just stop. She's going to be performance-based on that test. So I'm wondering... I'm sorry, but you tout this as a good curriculum, but the feedback that I got from it is it's bad. And I'm wondering, do you look at what you eat it? Yeah. Well, I, I, first of all, we don't even have a provision to dock people's pay based upon outcomes. Uh, and, and having just approved the ADA contract, I can promise you it's not in there because I've read it carefully. So there's no provision there, but if a student is, if a teacher is not succeeding as on a performance improvement plan, they now get a step increase. So maybe that's what she's referring to. Yes. Uh, and that may be the outcome. One of the issues of implementing the Common Core is it's going to be not something overnight. I think the reason that you're raising it is there. I think the teacher might be given some information that's a little bit confusing. Before, I, this, last spring I met with the director for the math program at a high school and said, Pat, I want to talk to you. So we met off with a coffee shop and we talked for a couple of hours and said it can't be done overnight. Because in eighth grade, we want people to have algebra and geometry behind them. You can't do that if they're in seventh grade. Uh, and if they're in fifth grade, it's going to be impossible, but in third grade, maybe you can make some transition. It can't be done overnight. We have to work on the transitions. And one of the things that the teachers at the, at the uh, academy were doing was trying to integrate that and realize that that can't be done overnight. You can't say, I want you at eighth grade level, and that used to be the tenth grade level, and we can do it in, within one year. We are academically behind. We've got a lot of catch-up. So, excuse me, how do you look hey, excuse at me, the teacher's yes, lessons? I'm not allowed oh, okay, to have yeah. going on the question. Yeah. 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 Have you looked at the curriculum? Oh. Have you, have you looked at the scope and sequence? Have do you, you, you review the, the curriculum? curriculum? The sequence? The sequence has got to be spaced, and if she's doing that, it's not going to be able to jump right to where it was. There has to be a sequencing event before we get there. We can't do that. Have you read it? 
So if they're jumping up to where they think it is for eighth grade and we've been at sixth grade level, it's got to still progress at a different level. Right, we don't you have look to look at it before you say this is the curriculum <clears throat> that we're using. I'm, I'm being told by the math right? director with the high school who's working with all of them is that they're sequencing it and to play catch up, they're not trying to jump, jump through anything. I so understand if that's what happening, you're they need saying, to talk to the director. It's not going to happen. Okay? I understand what you're saying. I'm not saying it's not. It's not. Okay. Okay, you were over here, sir. Mr. Higgins, yeah, Mr. Higgins, the question is for you. But before I give you my question, please remember that I am Barbara's husband. <laughs> but you made, you made some massive errors in statements. Five yes. times. Excuse me, I need to ask you a yeah, question. Five times you stated there were how many states have Boy, rejected five. Common Core? Would you please tell me how many have rejected Common Core? out of those 45, and why? The information I have, we have 45 states that have, that have adopted no it. No longer. Number two, mm -hmm. the math, okay. the, math the math, you... Uh, I'm sorry, I had to you, ask my husband to, oh, to okay. stop at one question, and I'm going to ask you to stop at one question too, Mr. Haney, or not Haney. But I'll give you a free shot afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> the next question I have, Tammy. Okay, well... I also have eight children. I am also a very committed independent homeschooler, so that will give you a little bit of where I come from. Um, I'm a little confused on your definitions of rigorous, of high standards, um, of no common core curriculum. So I'm going to try to address all that. I have seen pages from the workbooks, from the textbooks that are common core approved. Maybe we're using different words, but common core approved curriculums. We probably all saw on the internet where two plus two equals five. Doesn't matter if it's not five, but how did you get there? We've seen um, the, the textbooks, the workbooks where, it's, where they guide the children through how you feel and give them the, the, uh, the wanted objective of their feelings, you know, they have in mind what they want the child to feel and they guide them Mrs. Shields, do you I have, no, yes, I do. Um, I also want to know if, you know, Dreaming in Cuban, have you heard about that? It's a common core approved book, read out loud in an Arizona 10th grade English literature class. Mrs. Shields, I understand that there are lots of issues that you disagree with within the curriculum, so, but you've been speaking for a minute and a half and I have not heard the end of the question. Do you have a question? I was getting to that. Okay. My question well, I, is, are you familiar with any of these things? Are you familiar with Dreaming in Cuba, highly erotic book being approved as a Common Core uh, approved literature? Books. Common Core State Standards doesn't approve a curriculum, but there were books that people can adopt, and there were issues about the books being, for example, if you dealt with uh, Go Math, of making sure that the, what they teach in the sequence is on level with, with the Common Core Standards. But there isn't a Common Core adopted book. We aren't using that. If it was, everybody Not else would have adopted book, but there are adopted books. There's oh, who's adopting it? Because the books yes. are done by a local level. We adopt whatever we want to for curriculum. We adopt the books. We ban whatever books we want. We have uh, charter schools, and they are allowed to have their own curriculum, and we don't even direct it with them. They can pick whatever books they want. So the fact that somebody out there says it's common core adopted book, there is no authority to adopt a book except at the local level. So it doesn't even make sense. From my perspective, there isn't a common core curriculum because curriculums are established and voted on by local school districts. It isn't done nationally. Okay, I'm going to have Barbara jumping out of her skin in a second. So, one minute. Okay, we're going to get to an issue that is huge. And I keep asking, asking, asking. Because what our governor decided or what our... What our state government communicated to Washington in the No Child Left Behind waiver was that we adopted not just the common, the common core curriculum with a few word changes, but also the appendices. And that is from Scott Norton of the Chief State School Officers in the Education Elementary and Secondary Waiver, Flexibility Waiver. If we adopted those standards with the appendices, 
then dreaming in Cuban, the curriculum is part of it, because there is curriculum in the standards, and to sit there and say that there isn't is, is just, is just it's not true. Now, whether the state adopted the appendices is another matter, and that's the answer that everybody seems to not want to give me. All right, and in a way, it doesn't matter because when SPAC writes the test, it's going to be based on the literature that's in the exemplars that they're not okay. showing you. Thank you. Very good. Yes, ma'am. I have a question for Barbara. So, I just want a clear understanding that it keeps being said that we can use any curriculum we want. I am a homeschool mom now. My kids were in public school and I had all of us agree that there is challenges in our education system. I don't think anyone disagrees with that statement. But even there I was told, because I choose to use a faith-based curriculum, cool. okay? But I was told, now Mrs. Wright, you may not be able to use this for very much longer because of the Common Core and you're going to have to not use any faith-based curriculum that will not be allowed or your child the grades and things will be um, used as a component for future as we go down the line. But that, so my question is, when I've looked at some of the other states that are using the Common Core, there doesn't seem to be a lot of variety in the kinds of curriculum, and it's all being conformed to one curriculum and there not being a variety. Peers, yeah, peers don't so I just want to have, a, yeah, is there only going to be one kind of curriculum once the consortium starts and that's, that's been on um, Mr. Higgins, if I understand him, said, no, we can use whatever curriculum we want. But when I finally looked at the other states, they're only using, we told to use one. So the question out there is there's only going to be one curriculum, and the question is to you, Barbara. The market forces appear to be moving in that direction. However, you can always use source material, you know, as a homeschool mm -hmm. you can do. And, you know, you always have the higher education institutions of your own faith. That may, I mean, I don't know what your, which, I don't know what your religion is, but for example, in the, in the Baptist churches, they're pretty much ignoring the whole thing. They're just, they're teaching what they've always taught because they, they don't seek, seek state, state sanction. So, you know, if you don't take the state money, right. if you don't take the money, right. you're not tied to their. And then next question. Okay. I'm feeling a little beat up here. <laughs> I'm a parent of, well, three and a half, and we're, we just started homeschooling this year because of the concerns that we have with so much money and resources being dumped into the school system and not seeing the results. And it's scary to me when I look at the ACT test scores and other scores that have been used for a long time, college entry and getting into the workforce. How many? I mean, five percent this year are prepared for college nationally. That's terrifying. My question is, how is this going to change that? You raise the standard, but does it actually, is it going to affect the ACTs and being actually prepared? Where is, is there any evidence that they're actually going to improve? Because I haven't seen anything that shows that it's a higher standard is going to make our kids prepared. That was directed to you. Okay. Well. Yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think that outcomes are directly related to expectations, my personal view. Uh, where we have evidence of it, we won't have evidence of what's adopted. I mean, you're not going not to have solid information. But in my opinion, if you have low expectations, you get low outcomes. Uh, I think uh, when you raise expectations, you raise them for the teachers, you raise them for the, for the classes, for the schools, but you raise them for the school districts, and they're being evaluated based on that, that's going to push them. I've seen, when I push the issue of high school graduation rates, before that, when kids left school or high school, nobody knew where they went. After I pushed that issue, they were tracing them out, running after them in the parking lot to find out why they were leaving because they didn't want to leave. Because people were watching it. And people were monitoring it. And people knew that was important. I think when we talk about outcomes and we put standards and we let people know we're looking at them and they get feedback, this year every school, every teacher got feedback on how they did academically with their students. They know we're watching. They know it's important. They know it's valued. I think it has a positive outcome. Uh, but you want proof of it? I think it's going to be something that takes time to prove. Because it, it, every time you adopt a new system, the only absolute proof you're going to have is evidence after you implement it. But I think, the, I think it's logical that you're going to see the outcome. I know that lots of you have questions, but there were fewer hands raised last time. And 
it's 9.15, and I'm having to watch the second hand and try and listen at the same time. So I'm going to ask you all to socialize and ask these questions personally. I am sure that Mr. Higgins would give you his email address, which is on the Anchorage School District website. Barbara Haney has given us two websites. One of them is stopcommoncoreak.com. Stop Alaska Stop Alaska Common Core.com. And there was a second one in there. And there's also Facebook for Barbara. And I will put the risk of putting my cards back here. If you got a question, they give you the email. And uh, if I can do one honor, because when you introduced me, you mentioned my grandson, Aiden, but I have two more since then. Oh, that's we have right. Oi and, and Sophia. So I didn't want to leave them out in case it's wrong. So just a moment. I think that these two have done a fantastic job, and I'm very grateful. Where, where are you going to link this to, or where's it going? Uh, it's going to go, well, you can listen to the audio of...